Welcome back, Inebriate. It is your host, as always, Andy. Uh, and today I'm joined by Michael Goldwasser. Um, and that's the second time I've got that name right, so I'm really proud of myself today. Um, from the Easy Star All Stars, which um, I don't I do, do people find that as tongue twistery as I do, Michael? Yes. I mean, oh. I, um, first of all, hi, Andy. <laughs> Second of all, yes, we get called every name in the book, and every once in a while we get called Easy Star All Stars. Um, but the origin of the name is just like we started this label, Easy Star Records, 1996. Um, I was producing everything and, and co writing with different artists, and I would get together different groups of artists in the studio based on the day, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, um, this bassist can't make it, I'll get that bassist, or I'm going to play bass, I got to get someone else to play guitar. Um, and then we just thought for branding purposes, we should have a name for this band. And we thought, well, we're Easy Star Records, and it's an all-star cast of all the best reggae musicians in the New York area. So why not call it Easy Star All-Stars, not realizing that it would be a name <laughs> mangled for the rest of our existence. But it's all good. Yeah. No, that's, that's kind of a cool, I mean, like a reggae super group. Um, I, I kind of like that. The, the origin but it is it's a little tongue twister but you know I'll, I'll live um i'll try not to mess it up you so. can say um you can just say easy star if you want to abbreviate it you can say esa you know or just yeah. mess it up as much as you want <laughs> i appreciate you power that. To edit right so uh uh yeah my editor does that so we'll just dub yeah. it in okay. uh at post so you you guys started this label and it is so here in massachusetts i feel like more and more reggae is on a bit of a, a upswing or a surge or however you want to call it is it that way in new york is that like how did how did you get like why reggae specifically well okay um first of all i've been into reggae for a pretty long time um i remember growing up in new york city we're a new york city based label um growing up in new york city i heard reggae it wasn't like this weird music i'm like what is that you know it's just kind of normal to hear some reggae um and then uh, I, I went to a, what's called a, a specialized high school, um, where, but it actually started in seventh grade and it was in Manhattan. I grew up in Queens, which is one of the other boroughs of mm -hmm. New York city. So I would take a bus and a subway into, uh, Manhattan starting, uh, from the time I was 12. And the reason I bring this up is because I was around older kids from the time I was in seventh grade hearing and you know, they'd be listening to a boom box in the hallway or outside. And I was hearing reggae and ska and two tone ska was, was having a bit of a resurgence at that point. Um, so I heard a lot of it and I dug it. And then, um, I also, uh, I'm Jewish, which is why you struggled with my last name for a moment. And no, Sorry, you can edit that. I thought out. I did pretty good. <laughs> you did pretty great, but you were wor you were concerned. You I'm know? always concerned. It could be Smith, right, right. but I'd still be worried. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So anyway, um, so I grew up going to synagogue and hearing um, all these parts of the Jewish scripture in Hebrew, and then I realized when I started listening to reggae that there were a lot of lyrics from Bob Marley, Dennis Brown, lots of top reggae artists that were basically just English translations of these Hebrew, of the Hebrew Jewish liturgy, you know? So oh, I made, really? Oh, word up. So yeah. like, I, and the reason for that, <laughs> if you've got some time, is that, um, so reggae as maybe some of your listeners know, some don't, so I'm just gonna lay it out there. Um, so a big part of reggae is the Rastafari mm -hmm. uh, spirituality. Some would call it a religion. Some Rastas say it's not a religion. Um, and Rastafari was founded in Jamaica in the 30s. And Jamaica has a, a very strong culture, a Christian culture. Uh, and I think it has like the most churches per capita of any country in the world. Okay. Um, and the denominations of Christianity that were most popular there were ones that looked back to Jewish scripture or what uh, Christians would call the Old Testament. I just mm -hmm. call it the Testament. Um, and um, they, lo they were emphasizing like the stories of sl being slaves in Egypt and the exodus from Egypt 
um, and the idea of a return to Zion. Um, and so that was very deeply embedded in people's uh, consciousness or even subconsciousness in Jamaica as a whole. So the founders of Rastafari, they kind of extrapolated on that when they founded Rastafari, and they took a lot of the same themes, the idea of uh, freedom from slavery, um, an exodus, um, and a return to Zion, but they, you know, for Jews, Zion is Mount Zion in Jerusalem. They took Zion to mean Ethiopia. Um, and a lot of the iconography, such as like the Lion of Judah and, um, say what's known as like the Jewish star, the six pointed star, they took on all these symbols that to me were Jewish to them, mm -hmm. represented Rasta, but to me, it's just a great connection. You know, like I got it. I was like, wow, we're. These people are singing these songs that I know, you know, I know these lyrics, you know, just in a different language. Um, and it just made me feel at home with with reggae in a certain way. Um, and then aside from all that, I just really dug the music. You know, I really just felt the reggae vibe overall, like even um, like there's plenty of reggae songs that I don't like or reggae music that I've heard that I don't think is good, but even the stuff I don't like it still might kind of make me move in some, some way, you know, like something about the reggae beat or beats, because there are many different beats in reggae, um, somehow moves me. And a part of that also is it all comes from the heartbeat, which is like this beat that goes all the way back to Africa and mm -hmm. which is kind of like the essence of so much music. Um, and I, so I think it could resonate with anyone who has an open heart and an open mind. It's just that society, especially Western society has, has kind of closed people's minds to different styles of music, or this is other music. That's not your music, or this is black music and you're white. That's not good. You know, um, or, um, you know, I can't understand their accent, so I'm just not going to listen to the music, all right. these crazy things, which to me are anti-music. Um, but pro keeping the powers that be in power and keeping the people down. Wow, did I digress? You but, said so many things that I want to address. <laughs> okay, sure, sure, address. Um, no, but first of all, like I find it really interesting because you know, and I, I I know a little tiny bit about reggae as far as musicians wise, because um, it's kind of a genre I've just dipped my toe into fairly recently. But like you know, Modest Yahoo has always been like a very famous person i always thought that was an odd connection but obviously it's not as odd as i thought yeah well i think a lot of people don't see that connection because they don't have the uh because they don't know about it you know right no jewish liturgy so how are they going to know that these lyrics come from it you know yeah but the other the other thing where you you, you mentioned how you know i'm not going to listen to that person because i don't understand what they're saying you know i i i i've found and maybe it's because i grew up listening to nirvana where no one knew what they were saying um but to me it, it, the voice is an instrument and you don't you know you can still get the feeling behind what the song is even if you don't understand I, i'm i really like um uh detzel and he's a russian rapper i don't speak russian but i listen to him fairly regularly because the music is great you know and yeah. I can get the emotion behind it. I don't know exactly what they're saying. I don't, I don't know anything what they're saying, but you can get the emotion from the song. So I, I think that is is really valid. That if you if you enjoy the music, you don't necessarily have to know what they're saying. Oh yeah, I love lots of lots of music from different cultures with different languages that I don't understand. You know, but that's part of the the beauty of music. It is it's been called the universal language. You know, mm -hmm. and, that's, and I believe that's true. It may sound trite, but it really is true that. Um, music is a different form of communication, a different form of language that c can convey meaning and certainly feeling without an understanding of actual words or the, or instrumental music can be a language, you know, sure. that conveys meaning and feeling, you know, it's just, again, it's just about people having open minds and open hearts to, to all different things. Yeah. And it's like, you don't have to speak English to know Rage Against the Machine is angry. There, there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I kind I kind of love that. And so I, I've been listening to you guys for about a week or so because um, I just got your your um, your information from the PR. Um, shout out to them. 
girly, uh, girly action. Girly action. Shout out to girly action. Um, they're great. I love them. They're they're fantastic to us. Right. So give them a little shout out here. It's really cool. I don't I don't think um PR agencies usually get shout outs. And on- they should. I mean, they're they're yeah, very they're, active. They're you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, where was I going? I, I got sidetracked by my own shout out. That's right. awesome. <laughs> uh, so oh um so uh easy star all stars it's written down I have to read it um it, it, would you consider it a cover band cuz like you guys are are taking music and putting it in like into a reggae feel that wasn't reggae to begin with i mean i, I don't i feel like cover band's not the right term but how, how like how would you describe that um well look some people call us a cover band and you know that's cool i consider us a band that happens to pay tribute to a lot of music that people love you know we also have original material that's less heralded you know mm-hmm. but, but I, which i think is very good you know um and i'm not just saying that because i produced it and co-wrote on it and played on it i really do think that a lot of our original material is great strong reggae and with all different influences of all different kinds of music um so yeah i mean cover band makes me kind of think of like a bar and yeah and that's why i don't don't like that term playing like you know whatever music so um i don't love the term but i just want people to listen to us i don't care what they call us just (laughs) just listen (laughs) just listen yeah and i find it so interesting because there's i mean even so many bands that i listened to growing up that would cover songs and i see people my age get mad at more recent bands that will cover a song and that somehow it's their fans fault for not knowing it pre ex, you know, existed yeah. before them. Um, but you know, there, you know, there were songs that Nirvana played that later on, I'm like, Oh, I didn't realize that was, you know, a cover or, yeah. you know, I mean, it's kind of a natural thing to do to pay tribute to the people that came before you. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, look, the history of music is the history of covers. I'm sure, you know, back in the, renaissance some troubadour was like yo uh, i heard that other troubadours thing it's pretty cool i'm gonna do that (laughs) um so um but no no i mean you know in reggae there's a very long history of covering american tunes especially um but also like the you know early reggae well ska music which predates reggae you know which is popular in jamaica from say like 1960 to 64 um, they were covering songs from Cuba, even, you know, it wasn't just covering US R&B or pop. Um, but what we do, I'd like to think what we do is different in the sense that when we do one of these albums, I spend months, if not sometimes more than a year, just writing the arrangements. Like I really, um, I try to take it very seriously, but we have a sense of humor, but to respectfully uh reinterpret the source material in an interesting way like i really want these albums to stand up as as uh i don't know it sounds so pretentious as pieces of art on their own (laughs) they're allowed to be pretentious feel free to slam me on that fans but no i mean i want it to be an album that people can sit down listen to the whole thing from start to finish because that's how i like to listen to albums i know i'm you know that that's not how many people consume music now but that's how i grew up and i still like an album where i can listen to side one and flip it over listen to side two and each side is a journey from this first song on side one to the last song on side one is one journey and then you flip it over to the, no- the other side and then from the first song to the last song is a- another journey and then as a whole those two sides are are a third journey you know and to me i and maybe i read too much into it but i really i love looking at albums that way so i try to make these albums a journey um and on our latest album which i hope you're going to want to talk about um ziggy stardub which is uh, a reinvention of david bowie's rise and fall of ziggy stardust and the spiders from mars um i really tried to bookend it and make the first song five years ha- share some qualities with the last song rock and roll suicide to kind of say you know this is the journey and and maybe it brings you back to where you started from um because of various elements so I'll, i'm i'm thinking i'm not you know i don't go into the studio with the musicians and say hey guys um we're gonna cover this thing everyone just jam and see what happens you know like i plan this stuff out um 
maybe even some people might say obsessively, you know, and, and to, until I really feel like, like every song uh, is doing justice to the original and that the album as a whole is doing justice to the original. I mean, that's something that like I recall doing as a kid, making a mixtape where you're trying to get, you know, the 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 songs, not just the the songs you like, the songs in the in the quote unquote right order. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's some of that with playlists now, but I feel like that's something that's kind of lost. So yeah. how when you created your or when you started working on the new album, like how did how did you determine what order the songs were in with such a no vast catalog of Bowie? Well, because this is just the songs on the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Oh, so it's oh okay. I'm sorry. Our album. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I we did not change the order. I mm -hmm. was locked into that, you know, so I didn't have to make those decisions. Um, the only decisions we had to make in terms of track listing was we did I, I did a few dub mixes of some of the songs. We put those on the end. And then we added um, a new version of All the Young Dudes, which David Bowie wrote at the same time that he wrote um, the, the songs on Ziggy Stardust. And, you know, we just all loved that song. We thought it'd be really cool to do All the Young Dudes. So we put that on at the end as well. Um, but the album proper is the same order as the David Bowie original from 1972. Nice. So when you decide to go with Bowie was he kind of like on a short list or, or like what what made you I mean Bowie's phenomenal but like why why choose Bowie now yeah Is it well kind of like a tribute um, to well it we had been thinking about this particular album for years um I think you know when we were approaching doing our third album which wound up being um Easy Star's Lonely Hearts Dub Band which is our tribute to the Beatles Sgt. Pepper album I think at that point we had thought about Bowie about Ziggy Stardust and uh, specifically and then our same with our fourth album but we wound up doing uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller mm -hmm. Easy Stars Thriller so this album had been on our mind for many years and I was a big proponent of doing it just being a big fan of the original album uh, from when I was a teenager. In fact, what's really funny is that recently a friend reminded me that he first, he didn't know this album. He heard my high school band play the song Five Years at a show at CBGB's, which was a very famous club here in New York. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. In, I don't know what year it was, probably like 1987 or something or 86. And and that's how he discovered what then became his favorite album, which is just so funny to me because I don't really, I kind of remember <laughs> playing the song, but not really. Um, but it, it's just, so it all comes together, you know, over the course of decades um, where this album has kind of been in my system for a long time. So it, it felt really good to, to work on it. it. It's funny, like as you're, as you're talking about your albums, I realized that I was missing that journey that you were talking about because I was just listening on YouTube and it was kind of like jumping from song to song to song. And it didn't occur to me that like when you put out the album, it was all Michael Jackson because there was a Pink Floyd one as well, uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Yes, our first album was Dub Side of the Moon um which was dark side of the moon then we yeah. did radio dread which was okay computer by radiohead um and then easy stars lonely hearts dub band and easy stars thriller and now ziggy startup so our our concept is to take albums that in their original form really worked as albums mm -hmm. and, and whether they're quote unquote a concept album or not just seemed like a a solid piece of work that made sense to listen to in order um and they all we also we only want to do iconic albums as well um and then reinterpret them in in the reggae style uh you know lots of people could do a greatest hits of of david bowie or the beatles or whatever and some, some people have and that's cool but that's not what we do you know because i'm such a music nerd that i'm like i gotta do an album and you know i, I put i'm I sometimes make it more difficult for myself, I guess, by being so strict about this. But I really do feel like uh, I want to help preserve the concept, not a concept album, but I want to mm -hmm. preserve the concept of an album as uh, a way to listen to music and yeah. not just in this day and age of streaming and jumping around and listening to 30 seconds of a song at most and those kind of things. 
I that's legitimate. I know that's how, especially younger people, listen to music now. Um, but I want there to be the option to have albums out there that make a statement. Yeah, and and like I'm even feeling that urge. So we we've, we've been blowing up. We've been getting so busy that I'm kind of now trying to schedule my downtime because <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not good at downtime. Um, and one of the things that I find really appealing and that I haven't just done yet and I just need to pull the trigger is um, a friend of mine uh, attends bar at a local brewery and every Thursday she has vinyl night and people bring yeah. in their albums and she'll put on the side of the album that you want and just plays it all the way through and I'm like I need to get a record player and I just the idea of having like a, a solid record collection that I can just sit and listen to you know an album all the way through because I mean there there's you know uh, great albums that I, I went and saw uh, Jane's Addiction they played Ritual the Habitual all the way through and that was such a great experience yeah. you know I I love listening to vinyl I know that it's not the it's not an exact rep representation of the music as it is being played there's a lot that's going on you know there's a lot of compression um whether the recordings are compressed or not you know it's like once you're hitting the vinyl there's a certain compression and you're losing certain frequencies on the high end and low end and i so i understand it's not pristine like perhaps a cd is um but i like the sound of it I like the experience of listening to to vinyl like i said about like li the journey of the different sides and having to get up and flip over the record mm -hmm. um and re i love to like look at the, the credits um while i'm listening or just look at the album art um but i'm also i, I may be an anomaly like i like to listen to music and not do anything else you know i know a lot of people think of music as background music like people work at their computer and have music on in the background. I can't do that because I, I want to listen to the music as much as I can. And I feel like it's like, I don't want to disrespect the music. And I also can't really quite concentrate on my work if I'm listening to music because I get so distracted by the music. Um, but then again, a lot of my work is making music whereby I'm working and listening to music at the same time. Right. Um, but I'm saying like, like if you're at a computer or like people read books, and listen to music at the same time. Now, I'm not criticizing that. Obviously, many people do that, and that's cool, but I just can't do it. I got to have my full attention on one or the other. Um, so anyway, I highly recommend getting a, a record player and getting some records because um, it, it's, it's just a really cool experience. Yeah, it's it just there's something appear, uh, like really appealing about like the tactile nature of like, yeah, definitely. putting putting the, the, the record down and being, you know, you have to be delicate with the needle. It's, it's more of a... I think just the act of putting the record on makes you more engaged opposed to just being like, Alexa, play such and such, you know? Right. It, it feels more of a human experience to me. Yeah. So when you guys are playing out in concert, do you play in that same format? Where So like, will you just play the, the Bowie music now or will you kind of jump around to your other other stuff? Uh, no, we just set up a bunch of record players on stage and just play. <laughs> um <laughs> No, we're gonna we're gonna feature uh, a bunch of songs from the new album, but we also play a bunch of the Pink Floyd stuff and the Radiohead and Beatles, Michael Jackson. We play some originals. You know, we try to mix it up. Um, we want to make a fun show for people. It's great that people, you know, they love to sing along to these songs and stuff like that. Um, but you know, there's there are no rules except to put on a good show. But certainly mm -hmm. on this upcoming touring, we're gonna be featuring the David Bowie stuff. You know, because we're promoting the new album. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, and the other thing, so around here, I kind of, and whether it's right or wrong in my brain, I tend to lump jam bands and reggae in kind of together. Maybe it's just because of the, the venues that play that type of, of music around here. But um, is there that kind of aspect to reggae where, you know, there, there'll be, Improv Im improvisation and solos that will deviate from what people are expecting to hear is that like kind of part of the nature of reggae uh i wouldn't say it's part of the nature of reggae per se but there's maybe an analog to it that um sometimes when we're playing live or another reggae band is playing live they'll go into what's called like a dub section where you know everyone drops out except maybe the bass and the drums and the the sound man will put 
effects on the drums. Um, and then sometimes, um, you know, say the drums and the bass will drop out and it's just, you know, the keys and the guitar um, with effects on those, you know, so it's kind of a way of extending the song in an interesting sonic way, uh, but it's not relying on soloing necessarily, but it is improvisation on, on a certain level. Um, but we do, we have solos in our songs and sometimes live we'll, we'll go nuts. And when we play money by Pink Floyd, you know, sometimes it ends with like an epic guitar solo, um, that goes on for quite a while and, and we all play off of each other. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, certainly jam bands and reggae bands, sh there's, there's some overlap in the Venn diagram, but, um, but not a, not necessarily a ton but i'd like to think that people who are into jam music would also dig reggae you know yeah and, and the one that surprised me was you said ska predated reggae which i'd never heard of until i'd say the mighty mighty boston's came on the scene so i find that like really surprising like i didn't realize that was i feel like you're giving me like a history lesson of reggae today oh cool man uh, <laughs> well listen uh what you think of as ska is ska, but that's considered like the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones are probably, I'd call them like third wave ska, right? Okay. So first came Jamaican ska, um, which was obviously from Jamaica, and its heyday was the early 60s. Um, and that then, uh, after that came something called Rock Steady, which was a little more, a little slower. And then ska and less horn centric and more vocal centric. Um, a lot of like a lot of ska was instrumental. Um, all there are a lot of great vocal ska songs too. And then in the late sixties, you know, it, it slowed down even more and became what we know as as reggae. Um, so you have the first wave of ska in Jamaica in the early sixties. Then you have uh, the second wave is the what happened in the UK primarily. In the late 70s early 80s called there was a label called two-tone and bands like the specials and the beat who are known here as the english beat um madness the selector uh they were playing a kind of you know it was based on jamaican ska but but sounded very different and it had an english sensibility to it um although some of the people playing it were of jamaican or caribbean uh, parentage but growing up in england um, and then the third wave of ska uh, was, I, I don't know, maybe like late 80s, early 90s is when bands like the Boss Tones came around in the U.S. and no doubt started out playing a lot of ska. Um, there were bands in New York, like the Toasters were a, a band that's still playing. There's a band, Bim Scala Bim, who I think are from. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember them. Um, so, so, yeah, and now I don't know. I don't know what wave of ska we're in. But but Scott originated in Jamaica before before all this stuff. Yeah, we we had um, I'm blanking on his name, but he was in Big D in the kids' tables, in the kids' table on the show not too long ago. Another Boston Scott band, and okay. he's he was saying how like he felt Scott always kind of like resurged in tough times because it's a very upbeat. You know. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but I mean, hey, when isn't it tough times for right. sure. any people in the U.S. or the world? Um, if you want to check out some really great older ska, just look for anything by this group called the Scatolites, um, S-K-A-T-A-L-I-T-E-S, and just try to find stuff that you could tell is from the, the 60s, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you'll hear a lot of great stuff, and I think you'll put it together like, oh, okay, this is where the boss tones came yeah from. that's that's one of my favorite things about doing this is like just it, it's a great way for me to find new content and music or films or whatever and you know what my my guess my podcast is a little self-serving in that way but um you know the idea is hopefully other people get to to hear it too yeah um so and that's always one of those things like i remember being a kid and and mtv was right or wrong that's where a lot of people got their new bands and their new music from do you think it's easier or harder for people to kind of discover um your band oh man i don't know i mean um there's just so much stuff being released every day 
like thousands of pieces of music being released to DSPs every single day. So, and a, such a small percentage of it really ever gets heard, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a history and we have a fan base um, for, for new people to discover us. It's, uh, I think a lot of it is maybe word of mouth or being on the right playlist. Of course, that's, you know, yeah. important. Our, our kind of stuff, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to, to the short 15 second TikTok clip, you know, which is no. how young people <laughs> no. stuff. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, and obviously we, we work with PR agencies and do digital marketing, you know, we have to put, put that effort into it, but, um, you know, I'd like to think that people who, if they're searching for new reggae will, will find us. Um, but it's, it's really quite a challenge now, you know, um, when, like I said, when thousands of pieces of music get it released every single day, you know. But it's cool, man. We've already gotten, I mean, besides being on your podcast and other podcasts, um, Rolling Stone already wrote about us. Oh, um, cool. I was featured in Spin Magazine. Um, not talking about the album per se, but hopefully that'll draw attention to it. Um, other uh, Consequence of Sound wrote about us. So, you know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting to some good tastemakers, which is great. So I kind of forgot that you started this all as a record label. Um, so how is, how do you balance that between running the record label and running the band on the record label? It, 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 I mean, everybody wears different hats when they're kind of self-employed, but is yeah. that a challenge or? Um, well, look, I don't run a whole lot of the business of the label. My partner is taking more of the business side and I'm more involved in the music side, but yes, I do. Um, I am involved and I'm also, you know, overseeing the band and uh, I don't know, everything in life is balanced. I, I feel like I'm always working on 10 different things at once. And then I have a family and, you know, uh, it's just, you just got to figure it out, you know, and, you, you know, I have my list every day of all the stuff I'm supposed to do. And if I get to half of it, then I feel lucky, you know, or accomplished, you know, I can sleep <laughs> half, yeah. my half. That's pretty good. Um, so, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, the easy star label like wh what other bands are on it mm. yeah, sure um well we've been around we started in 1996 we dropped our first singles in 1997 um on 45 you know rpm seven inch vinyl um and we've put out our first album in 1998 and then we've just been doing it ever since um we've worked with um uh, oh, one band that I think has some cachet up in your area, John Brown's Body. Um, they have a bit of a, I believe they have a good following in New England. They're from upstate New York. Um, and um, we've worked with Revolution, who are one of the bigger U.S. reggae bands, The Green, based in Hawaii. Um, we've worked with some great Jamaican artists, um, Protégé, uh, who has been nominated for two Grammys so far. Um, Jesse Royal, who uh, very recently had a, a Grammy nomination. Um, uh, Mortimer and Samory I are two more up-and-coming Jamaican artists who are both featured on the Ziggy Stardub album and amazing, amazing talents. They're two of my favorite singers, so I'm really, really happy to have them on the label. Um, we, we've worked with Sister Carol, who is a, a legend in the U.S. reggae scene. She came to the U.S. Uh, when she was a teenager from Jamaica and has done a lot of great stuff and, and has been kind of at the forefront of women in reggae and she's performing with us. I don't know when this is going to air, but we're doing a big release show in New York City on April 20th and she's performing with us. Um, so maybe that will have passed by the time anyone hears this. But I think that will have already gone by. No problem. Um, the point is, uh, we still, you know, we first, I first produced her in like 1997 and we still have mm -hmm. a great relationship, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, we work with a lot of, a lot of great artists. Um, we, we tend to work with artists that share our, our values. You know, we, we really care about, um, all these, you know, antiquated ideas like, um, ethics and, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, equality and, um, you know, pushing forward, you know, say liberal values. Um, but yeah, so we work with a lot of really, really cool people. We work with a lot of 
uh, artists that I grew up listening to, which is amazing for me. Like I'm in the studio producing artists that when I was a teenager, I'd be listening to on vinyl in my bedroom. And I never could have imagined I'd be producing them now. So that's really, really cool artists like Steel Pulse, uh, Third World, um, Luciano, uh, Sugar Mine Out, we've done a lot with. He passed away, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so many, so many cool artists. It's really, it's been a, a great journey for me to be able to go from a fan to a producer, songwriter, musician, working with these people that I love. So a lot of what you're doing um, reminds me of a band from back in my college days. Um, they're an industrial band called uh, Pig Face. And um, oh, I'm going to blank on the guy's name, Martin something or other. It was basically his band, and it was whoever was kind of hanging around that he'd want to work with. And he put together like the, the studio um band and they put out an album but when they would go on tour they'd end up with like a completely different band on tour just because it was like who could go on tour who could perform and you'd have people sit in and like fleas played with them and all these different people is that similar like do you stick with that same makeup of that band if you're touring or gigging out or or wherever or is it more like who's around that can play on such and such a gig or can go on tour or whatever the the touring band doesn't always play on the records mm-hmm but they sometimes do, you know, they're part of the, the collective. A lot of people from the touring band uh, did play on the, on the Ziggy Stardub album. Um, you know, and, the, and the, the band is often in flux, but not in a bad way. It's, it's, it's natural when a band's been around for 20 something years that personnel is going to change. And that's cool. That's fine. You know, so and there is there are a lot of great musicians in New York still. Um, yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, there's no hard fast like these are the people that has to be they have to be on this recording and that recording and and live you know it's just the right people for for each job yeah that's what i i, I like it because it doesn't sound like it's you know you're out it sounds more like hey man do you want to sit in on this song or, or that kind of to me it, it feels more like those days of like hanging around in, you know, someone's garage and, you know, people come in and play a different, almost, I don't want to say open mic, but kind of that vibe where people can kind of come and go. And I think that makes a really interesting uh, vibe for a band. Well, except that I'm, I'm too much of a control freak to make it into an open mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd like to think of myself not as a control freak, but just as like a, a dedicated producer, you know, um, and band leader. So I really try to, you know, always put the band in the right uh, position to 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 succeed. Um, and ideally, one day I would love to have my own like super amazing studio that could be the home base where yes, people passing through might wind up playing on something for me that then gets released on Easy Star and called Easy Star All Stars. You know, even if they're not generally part of the band. Um, but speaking of All Stars, just one thing I wanted to point out because you you seem to have uh, an eclectic musical tastes. Um, very much. So two really great, uh, guest musicians played on this album that probably people wouldn't expect. One was, uh, Vernon Reed from living color. Oh yeah. He's a guitarist. And a great I saw guy. them play two summers ago. Okay. I think it was two summers ago. Yeah. Awesome. And also, um, Alex Lifeson from rush plays guitar on the album, which, um, wow crazy like i, I kind of even can't believe that that i was able to make it happen but he was a super nice guy too um and then um other artists on the album that show our eclecticism um fishbone sings on a song the two, yep. two fishbone. i remember them I've been a fan of theirs since their very first ep um and macy gray sings on the album um who is obviously she's not associated with reggae at all but i just really felt like for the song rock and roll suicide that she could bring the right emotion or pathos to to it and she she knocked it out of the park and i'm really really psyched about that um because really music should not have boundaries right so it's like we're making it's a reggae album but if we use singers from outside of the world of reggae it doesn't make it less reggae you know yeah and i i feel like those kind of restrictions or, or categories um, I feel like we're similar age, you know, we used to go into record town or strawberries or whatever your local 
record store was and there was five genres and now i feel like you'd be hard pressed to have 500 you know because everything is like more composite of of music yeah and i i like it so much better because i feel you know my when i was in high school you were into rap you were into metal or you were into pop and like there was very little crossover and my kids now are just kind of like oh i was listening to sea shanties and you know my son always has weird you know uh bands that he's she's like oh you should check this out and it, i i think that that those walls kind of came down with with the internet and, and i really like that so i think that kind of crossover is awesome yeah i i agree i i discover music from my kids sometimes i mean a lot of it i don't happen to like but some every once in a while they introduce me to an artist that i think is really interesting the one that my kids uh well my youngest actually uh brought to my attention it's a band called ghost i think i've heard of ghost but I and don't. to me i'm like they look really badass and gothic and then i was listening to their music and i'm like wow i don't and you know and music taste if you like it you like it but did not enjoy it because it didn't they look like they'd be very very heavy metal and they weren't at all and it, maybe it was just managing my expectations because it wasn't at all what i expected it to be but maybe your kid was trying to teach you don't judge judge your book <laughs> yeah don't judge a band by its album cover you know yeah <laughs> maybe a thumbnail photo on uh on on spotify you know um yeah um are your kids musical yeah they are one of my my older daughter goes to a performing arts high school and she okay. loves musical theater but she she's also into uh soul and jazz um she's she's a great singer um i haven't pushed her in that direction but i try to help her my younger daughter is also a great singer but she doesn't really have any formal training she's just she's just pretty good at it um and there's always music in the house and they've been exposed to all different kinds of music like they i'm a big fan of uh the nigerian founder of afrobeat uh a fellow on kuti who if you don't know you should get into because he's amazing i don't even know if i could spell that <laughs> to search for it just search for fella f-e-l-a f-e-l-a and, and then you'll probably when you search for that you'll see on kuti and you'll be like oh okay that's how it's spelled yeah um anyway so he sings in a, a combination of english sometimes a little French and then different Nigerian dialects. And my kids know <clears throat> phonetically like all the words to some of his songs in, you know, Yoruba or whatever, whatever Nigerian dialect he's singing in, you know, just because it's so great, you know? So, um, which goes back to our conversation from before about how you don't need to understand music to, to get yeah, it. to appreciate it. Um, yeah. But yeah, my kids are, are really musical and, uh, you know, definitely makes me proud. Um, but they also they see what a challenge it is to have a life uh, with music as a profession. You know, they they you know, I don't talk, talk to them about like income and stuff like that, you know, but they, they see sometimes the ups and downs of, of my career. Um, and while, yeah, they've had some exciting experiences, you know, going backstage at some big concerts. And I've, I've worked with some pretty, pretty big art, artists outside of Easy Star. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great, but they also see sometimes how hard I'm working and then the project that I worked on doesn't blow up, you know, things like that. Um, so I hopefully they're going to grow up with a healthy idea of if they want to pursue music, what it might take and that it's not going to be easy. Yeah, and I, I think that's um, a common misconception about any creative field where people, you can be the greatest painter ever to exist but if you don't have the ability to market yourself and hit a deadline and you're, you're not gonna you know if you if you don't have the the work ethic you're just not gonna go anywhere you know it, I, there's I, so much more to it than i don't just, even think it's about the the work ethic man sorry to interrupt I don't, know. I don't think it's about the work ethic i think it's about connections man it's not about the hard work it's about the network you know you got to know the right people and if you don't you got to find the right people um, and you got to put yourself out there, knock on every door, you know, you might get rejected 99 times by the person who opens the door or won't even open the door, but that one time could really, uh, advance or even make your career. 
For sure. Yeah, that's that's a really good point because I mean, so many opportunities have presented themselves because of connections I've made or you know, a cold email I sent out and just a, a, on a whim, but yeah, I mean, it, it's you always just got to ask for permission, you know, and some sometimes people say yes. Let's yes, do it. I, I used to be so shy and reluctant to reach out to people. Um, and now I'm just like, I got nothing to lose, you know, unless they pull out a gun and shoot me. You know, <laughs> you know like I walk up to famous or well-regarded artists that I don't know if I'm in the right place. And I don't, I don't bombard them like, Hey, I'm me and you should love me, but I try Here's to my that. CD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, I mean, I used to do that sometimes and it never yeah. worked, but you know, you try to engage them and maybe there's a spark and maybe something good comes out of it, you know? Um, and like every time I go to LA, I'm based in New York. Every time I go to LA, I email, um, Quincy Jones's right hand man. And I said, I really love to meet with Quincy and I give him a little spiel and it hasn't worked out yet, but I'm going to keep trying. And Quincy hopefully will stay around a little longer. I know he just turned 90. Um, but I'm, I don't want to give up, you know, because I love Quincy Jones so much. I just want to get a chance to shake his hand and tell him how much I appreciate what, it, what he's done for, for music and done for me, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, there are other artists out there, like I just, for years, I've been wanting to produce for Shaka Khan. She's my favorite singer. And I finally, somehow this year, got in touch with the, a record label that she signed to, Then who then put me in touch with her lawyer. And I was out in LA and I, like, I could, she couldn't meet with me at the days I was there, but I'm just keep pushing, you know, because um, if you don't try, then you're never going to. Right. You know, there's no possibility of succeeding you know so you just i guess i guess i'm giving a pep talk to all those creatives out there just keep trying you know don't don't give up and really um stay positive you know and good things can happen and if they don't happen at least you tried yeah and that's like such a hard thing i think creatives are tend to be more reserved or introverted so it can be really challenging to do that but i mean email is a great way to kind of get over that because you're you still use email huh people still use email yeah why am i not supposed to (laughs) no no no, i'm kidding i just feel like Uh, like younger people like if if uh you know you email them they may not respond but then you like dm them on some uh social and they'll they'll get right back to you you know oh yeah yeah jeez Um, i'm i'm still trying to figure out tiktok i just nothing makes me feel older yeah i'm not um I'm not there yet either, but I would love for one of uh, the songs on Ziggy Startup to become a big hit on TikTok. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, look, music is, technology is always going to change. You know, cons- the ways of consuming music is just going to keep changing. And you either keep up with it or you don't. And, you know, we still sell physical, which mm-hmm. is amazing. Like, of course, streaming is a large percentage of what we do, but we still sell vinyl. We still sell CDs. Um, there is an audience for that as well. Um, but, you know, we need to think about the younger people and, and how they consume music. So, Michael, when I go out and buy my uh, turntable, where can I go to get the new album? Uh, we should be available, let's see, up near you. Well, I'm sure your podcast is listened to all over the world. So you can... Yes. Just go to your record store and say, hey, I want the new Easy Star All-Star Ziggy Stardub. Um, Newberry Comics, which I know is does have stores, I think, in Massachusetts. Oh, it's, uh, there's one like, um, I have new offices. This is maybe, maybe 10 minutes from a, a well, new they, they should definitely have it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you also, of course, you can order online from, you go to easystar.com, E-A-S-Y-S-T-A-R.com. Um, and we have a shop and you can, you can get that and we all, you know, we have cool t-shirts and we have all of our releases up there. So yes, it's never impossible to get an easy star record. <laughs> awesome. That'd, man. Be, that'd be a great uh, motto. Easy yeah. star records. It's never impossible to get an easy star record. Yeah. You got that nice voiceover voice too going. Thank you. I will happily do voiceovers for the inebriate <laughs> art In- podcast. If I could say it. Yeah. <laughs> um but thanks man this was awesome having you on i feel like i learned a ton which uh one of my favorite things to do all right and man. um yeah anytime you guys got something going on feel free to give us a shout out and 
we'll bring you back on. Uh, is there a tour to be announced for this? Yes, but it also depends on when this is going to air. But we are um, we have spot dates um, coming up in the in the spring and early summer. Then we're doing a UK tour from August 10th to August 28th. Um, it's actually an England tour. The uh, the you the dates in other parts of the UK didn't work out. So an, an England tour of all of August. Um, we're playing the See Here Now Festival in Asbury Park, New Jersey. That's uh, mid-September. A lot of big uh, artists from the indie and rock and other worlds. Um, and hopefully in the fall, we're going to do much more extensive touring in the U.S. Oh, awesome. Yeah, this goes up, I think, either at the very end of this month or the beginning of May. Okay, cool. Um, we try to have a little bit of buffer so I don't lose my mind. Right but uh, again, thanks, man, so much. This was great. And right. uh, oh. Our listeners should go out and check out their stuff, and we'll catch you guys again next week. Okay. Take care. And thanks for checking out the show today, listeners. Uh, if you enjoyed the content today, you can go over to patreon.com slash inebriart to support the show. You can join over there for just a few dollars a month and help us provide this fun content that you just checked out. You can also email us at inebriart.com with your questions, complaints, and concerns, or you can find us on all social medias at inebriart or at inebriart6 on Instagram. And also don't forget to check out our other shows, Bar Talk Podcast, Old Colony Cast, Inebriart, and all the other shows on the Inebriart Network, which you can find at inebriart.com. Thanks again for listening.